Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our Sunday night service here at Beverly Hills Baptist Church. Uh, we're excited to gather here to hear uh, beautiful music and the preaching of the word. Let us go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather here tonight to worship you in song and praise. We pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in our words that are spoken. And we praise you and thank you that we can gather here. We continue to pray that you will work in a mighty way uh, in the kingdom's work uh, here on earth. And we uh, praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good evening. This evening we are going to sing, You Are My All in All. And if we really believe that Christ is our all in all, we can rest assured on that foundation and reflect on that. And no matter what's going on, what chaos, where we're sitting, um, how we feel, knowing that he is our all in all can bring us great comfort and joy. So as we sing this, sing out loud at home with me tonight. afternoon service here at Beverly Hills. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, again, we'd like to say thank you so much for your financial support here. Uh, the gospel work is continuing ever going. Even though we're not able to meet in person, uh, we are still working uh, very, very uh, tirelessly for the gospel and for the kingdom here at Beverly Hills. And uh, we just thank you for your financial support. Again, if you have any prayer requests, if you would like to leave those in the comments below, uh, on Facebook or YouTube. You can also call the church uh, and email them to the church, or you can call me or email me personally. Uh, we would love to pray for you in any way that we can. Uh, just because we can't meet doesn't mean that we can't continue to pray for one another. And so if there's anything that we can do to help you, please feel free to contact us. Again, the church uh, office hours are 9 to 2, Monday through Thursday. Uh, and you can contact me at any time, uh, personally at my cell phone or my email, uh, at 24 hours a day. If it is 3 o'clock in the morning and you need prayer, please call me. I would love to pray for you any way that I can minister to you and to your family. Uh, but we are uh, very excited about the work that is carrying on here at Beverly Hills. At this time, we would love to have some special music. Psalms 42 1 says, As a deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, God. Desire and I long to worship 
If you will turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, and we will begin in verse 35. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. My question for you this evening is this. Have you ever felt passionately about something? Is there something in your life that you are just overwhelmingly passionate about? Now, I've met a lot of passionate people in my life who are very passionate about what they believe in. But I can honestly say that I have never met someone as most passionate as I could have met in UK sports fans. UK, if you don't know, the University of Kentucky sports fans are the biggest, most passionate uh, fans that I think I have ever met. So a funny story goes is that uh, when I first met my wife and uh, moved to Kentucky and I got to know her mom and dad, uh, they had asked me what sports team that I was going to pull for. Now, knowing that I was a diehard North Carolina boy from Catawba County, uh, just outside of Hickory, that uh, I probably watched sports and probably was a North Carolina uh, football or even basketball fan. Well, knowing that they were UK fans, University of Kentucky, I told them that since I was going to be going to school in Louisville to Southern Seminary, that uh, I was just going to pull for the Louisville Cardinals. Well, this devastated them. They even questioned the relationship that I and my wife had. Is this the man you want to marry because he is going to pull for Louisville? Well, that year for Christmas, I remember being excited to celebrate Christmas with my wife's family. And uh, I began to open up presents, and I began to notice a theme as I began to open up these presents. It uh, was a UK t-shirt, and then it became a UK pair of sweatpants. It was a UK ball cap, a UK socks. UK underwear, UK cups, and it continued that everything was the University of Kentucky. It would almost be that here in Richmond County, if you were to ask someone who their favorite team was, and they would say, oh, I'm going to pull for the South Carolina Gamecocks. They were just overwhelming, just a passionate about their sports. Now, I am very passionate about a lot of things. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would say that I am passionate about. I am passionate about how my steak is cooked. The only proper way to eat a steak is to cook it rare. Now my wife is looking at me and saying that is gross. And there's a lot of people who would not even dare eat a steak like that, but I love a rare steak. I am very passionate about my television show. The greatest television show on earth is NCIS. Leroy Jethro Gibbs is the absolute best character in any TV show. Uh, I'm also passionate about my hat collection. I have a hat collection that if I was to wear a different hat every day of the week, I'd have enough to go a month without wearing the same hat. Now, we can all joke about that. We can all talk about that there are things that we say that we're passionate about. But something that I am very passionate about, something that has been at the heart of me for uh, as long as I can remember, is that of being a pastor. I love people. God has uh, softened and moved in my heart for so many years and leading me towards the pastorate. And I love to minister to people. I love to call you and to say hello over the phone and to check on you. I love to come and visit. I love ministering to people because that is my genuine passion. I have a passion for preaching. I began preaching at the age of 15 and I have not stopped talking since. I love to preach the gospel. And so there are things that we talk about how we are passionate, but when it comes down to seriously talking about what is it that makes you passionate? What is it that you are passionate about? When we get into the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1 and verse 35, I want to take a look at uh, three things that stirred, three passions, that is, that stirred the soul of Jesus. What was it that Jesus, while he was here on earth, that moved him with passion. The first thing I want us to take a look at is that Jesus possessed a passion for prayer. Mark chapter 1 verse 35, uh, Mark writes, And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and he went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. Now let me give you just a little bit of history on the timeline. 
If you look back just a few verses before, you can see that Jesus was in the synagogue and this was on a Sabbath day. Uh, this was a Saturday, was considered the Sabbath in that time period. And the Sabbath ended, or Saturday ended, at 6 o'clock, or roughly sundown. And that is when people would then begin to move about because the Sabbath was done. It wasn't until later into the New Testament uh, that uh, Paul started to worship and to started to, to preach on a Sunday morning, which is the first day of the week, not the Sabbath or the last day of the week. And so Jesus is now having many of them come to him uh, on this uh, Saturday night, and they are beginning to bring the sick, and Jesus is healing them. But on Sunday morning, as the scripture says, very early rising up, uh, Jesus rises up and he goes when it is even still dark on this Sunday morning and he departs to a desolate place where he begins to pray. Now, there are four verbs that if you uh, will underline or highlight, if you take notes in your Bible, I want you to underline these four verbs. Rising, departed, went, and prayed. These four verbs show us through this first verse that Jesus possessed a passion to pray. He had a passion, a desire to have communication with the Father. Rising up very early in the morning, while it was still dark, before time had even uh, seemed to start, before the rooster had crowed, Jesus was up and he was off and he was departed, our second verb, and he went, our third verb, to a desolate place. Now, as we understand from the Greek word, this word desolate means uh, a wilderness place, a quiet place, a place where there was no distractions, a place where he could not be bothered. And there he prayed. What we see is that Jesus has the action of wanting to communicate with the Father. He goes to a place of where he will not be bothered, a desolate place, an isolated place, a place where he can have true communion, true conversation with the Father. Uh, you've often probably heard it mentioned, uh, whether it was uh, in a sermon that I have preached or a message that someone has preached, you've often heard the term, your prayer closet. Uh, go to your closet and pray. Jesus even talks about that when you pray. Go to a place where you are by yourself, where you can uh, pray to the Father without interruption. Uh, the Pharisees in that time period, those who will come to uh, find Jesus guilty and crucify him, the religious leaders of that time period, the Pharisees loved to pray out and about. And they would wait until the opportune moment where they were standing on the corner at the street. And they would pray these lavish prayers. Oh, Father God, see me here. Hear my words. And they would pray in this manner so that other people would see them. And that other people would see that they were making this spectacle. Almost making themselves puffed up and more religious than they really were. If we are to take an example of what it is to commune with the Father, let us look at Jesus and what he did. He went out to a desolate place. He went into a place where he could sit quietly. No disruptions. No one to interject. He went while it was dark. He went when it was dark so that he didn't have something to focus on. Something that would draw his attention away. But then could just focus to the Father. And there he began to pray. He began to have open communication with the Father. There's no telling what he prayed about at this time. We can only gesture that he prayed to the Father about what work that would be done here on earth, what work that would be doing in the beginning of his gospel ministry. Jesus ministered for three and a half years while he was uh, in on earth for his 33-year lifespan. And in that three and a half years, in this first year, Jesus is going to be preaching and teaching the gospel, and he is going to be healing those uh, and bringing in the authentication of who he is and authenticating the kingdom of God. Jesus possessed a passion for prayer. We can roll ourselves, role model ourselves after this, after Jesus, and seeing how he communes with the Father. We should take this example and take this to heart. We should rise up very early or even maybe late at night, whatever you prefer. Even if it is throughout the day, 
taking a moment just to stop and to pray to the Father and have open and honest communication. I can guarantee you there's nothing that you haven't or aren't going through that the Father doesn't know. There isn't a need, should I even desire to say, a want that you have that God cannot feel. There isn't a trouble, there isn't a storm, there isn't a worry that comes across your brow that God cannot solve. But when we take it to Him in prayer, when we show that we are truly dependent on Him, God will listen to His children. Jesus possessed a passion for prayer. Not only that, but Jesus possesses a passion for preaching. And Simon Peter and those who were with him searched for him. So Jesus goes out into a desolate place. He goes into an isolated area and he begins to pray by himself. Well, soon, shortly enough, a sunrise is going to come and the disciples are going to be looking for him. Now, no doubt, just a few hours before, uh, there was a wave of people that had come, a wave of people that had come and were begging Jesus to heal them. Those who were blind, those who were crippled, those who had skin diseases as a leprosy, uh, those who need forgiveness of sin had flocked. And Jesus was very busy knowing that the disciples had seen this. When time comes, they start to worry, where is Jesus? Is he again working and we're not with him? Are we not seeing what he is doing? Has he been carried away? And so Simon, uh, that is going to be Simon Peter and John and uh, Andrew, they begin to look for him. They begin to search for Jesus because they do not know where he is at. And they found him. And they said to him, everyone is looking for you. Now, no doubt there are still a lot of people who were probably looking for Jesus. Jesus, in a few verses before, had done some of the greatest miracles that had ever been done in that time period. Uh, healing leprosy, healing the blind man, healing those who could not hear, bringing about the authentication of the gospel. People seeing that he is God incarnate, that he is God in the flesh, that he is God himself working these beautiful, wonderful miracles. No doubt there were those who were searching for him who desperately needed him. And the disciples come and they find him and they say, Everyone, everyone is looking for you. Where have you gone? Now I can say that I do not fault the disciples for this. The disciples see the needs of the people. No doubt probably some of them even came from some needs in their family. We know that the overwhelming of the majority of the disciples were fishermen. That they were uh, poor in nature. Uh, we know that uh, Matthew was a tax collector and that maybe he had a little money uh, in his uh, pocket. But no doubt the disciples look around and they see the needs. They see the sickness. They see the poor. They see the hurt. They see the broken hearted. And they see that Jesus can solve these problems. But you see, that's not what Jesus came to do. Yes, it was what Jesus came to do, and that's exactly what he did. But Jesus also uh, has another directive from the Father. Jesus has another directive, and that is to be preaching the coming of the kingdom. Verse 38, and he said to them, that is, Jesus says to his disciples, Let us go on to the next town, that I might preach there also, for that is why I came out. Jesus here explaining to him that after he has come out of uh, his uh, place of sleeping, his place of rest, and he's went out and he has prayed to the Father in this desolate place, and he has taken time to commune with the Father. Now he tells them that even though there's a need, even though there is a hurtingness, that's not why I came. I came that I may preach to those who need it most. I came to preach the gospel. I came to tell them of the heavenly Father. The scripture tell us that Jesus did not come to bring peace on this earth. We can pray and pray and pray for world peace as much as we want, but it's never going to happen. Why? Because the Father and the Son tell us that that was never the case. The case was not to achieve world peace, but Jesus says, I come to bring the peace of the Father. Jesus says, I come to bring the peace of the Father that you may know him as your Savior, as your Heavenly Father. And that's what Jesus says. Let us go to the next towns. Notice that the word towns is plural. It is not singular. 
He was not planning on going to the next town and stopping, but he was going to continue to preach in every town that he could, in every place that he could, and preach that the coming of the kingdom was at hand and that he was there to forgive sin. That's why Jesus came. That's why I came out, he tells the disciples. We as believers in Jesus Christ have that same exact responsibility. We are to preach the coming of the kingdom. We are to continually preach Jesus Christ. It is not just the work of the pastor. It is not just the work of the Sunday school teachers. It is the responsibility of every person, every Christian, every disciple to preach Jesus Christ. Jesus possess a passion for preaching. Not only did Jesus possess a passion for preaching and possess a passion for prayer, but Jesus possesses a passion for people. And he went out throughout all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Um, Mark concludes this little part of his uh, gospel here by saying that Jesus went out and he went out through all the towns of Galilee to the little cities of this little fishing town. And he began to preach in their synagogues where he would teach that he was the son of God, that he would teach them that he had come to forgive sins. And he would teach them the law and that the law had not been abolished, but the law had been fulfilled and it had been fulfilled in him. And while he was there, he would begin to work miracles, the casting out of demons, the healing the lepers with skin issues, to heal those that were blind, that were deaf. He would begin to heal those by authenticating who he was in the gospel ministry. He did this because he has a passion for people. You see, if you don't have a passion for people, then you won't be around people. You isolate yourself. If you don't want to be friends with someone, you distance yourself. Jesus loved people. Why did Jesus love people? Because God, the Heavenly Father, loves people. Why? Because God loves His creation. Yes, God is love. God is also wrath. God is also judgment. But God is also grace and mercy. God loves us. I love God because he first loved me. I did not reach out and choose God. I did not reach out and choose God. God chose me first. God opened up my heart and my mind. He opened up who I was. And he opened up me so that I could see him and that I could love him. Why? Because God first loved me. Jesus loves people. And he goes out and he preaches to them. And he forgives them of their sins because he loves them. Could you imagine what it would be like to live in the town of Galilee and to hear that this Jesus was in town and being able to go and to see the God in flesh, to see Jesus himself? I could only imagine what these people thought when they see that their God, the one that they had been waiting for for hundreds of years, the one mentioned in the scriptures, the one prophesied in the Psalms and prophesied in his Isaiah, has come and he has brought the kingdom with him. I could only imagine what they would think. I could only imagine. But I know that one day I will see my Jesus face to face. Jesus possessed a passion for people. In conclusion, I want us to understand this. Jesus was consumed with a passion to do the will of the Father. Because he prayed to the Father, because he preached about the Father, and because he healed in the name of the Father. Jesus was consumed to do the Father's will. And for the next three and a half years, he will preach the coming kingdom and the work of the Heavenly Father because that is what he was called to do. He came to save sinners and to give his life. Now for us who are saved, those who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we should be consumed with a passion to do the will of the Father. We should be consumed with a passion to communicate with the Father. We should have a passion and be consumed to tell others about Jesus. And we should have a passion for God's people. 
because God first loved us. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, praising your holy name. We thank you that we can see this beautiful story and how Jesus came and preached the gospel and how he loved those around him. And we praise you that Jesus came and paid that ultimate price as a sacrifice for our sins. And that we, Lord, can reach out to you because you first reached down to us. Father, move in our hearts and minds that we will continue to preach the gospel to everyone around us. Simply telling them that Jesus loves them. Father God, we love you and we praise you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. If the Lord is speaking to your heart, wherever you're at, wherever you're doing, take a moment and just pray and ask God to move in your heart and in your mind. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer to praise your name, that we can call upon the name of Jesus, and that we love you because you first loved us, and that you loved us enough that you sent your Son to die for our sins. Father, we thank you, and we point the honor and glory to you. Our prayer, Father, is for those who know you as Lord and Savior, that you would move in their hearts and minds, that we would be more drawn closer to you, to bring in more uh, communion, to more in fellowship and prayer, to be more devoted to you. Father, my prayers for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that you will move in their hearts and minds, even using this gospel message to bring a softening of their hearts, that they will be more in tune with you and turning towards you as our Lord and Savior. And Father God, we praise your holy name, and it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.